Since the beginning of time, one animal has loomed large in folk legend as a sinister, often invisible presence that haunted the campfires of early man. To many of the world's primitive peoples, it represented the malignant spirit of the evil dead stalking the living, a shadow from the underworld. In medieval Europe, wolves were associated with witches and the Black Death, persecuted almost to extinction, even burned at the stake. For centuries, the timber wolf roamed the forests of North America, a powerful presence in the spirit world of the Woodlands Indians, who believed it could transform itself, sometimes into a man, sometimes into a raven. Today, the wolf is only found in remote areas, banished by man to the wilderness. Sharing his exile with grizzly bears, he treats them with respect. Like the grizzly, the wolf is not always a successful hunter, even with easy prey, like the ground squirrel. Here in the Canadian province of Nova Scotia, a remarkable woman is gently disproving the myth of the big bad wolf. For the last 15 years, Jenny Ryan has been studying the behavior of timber wolves, specially introduced to this area. Could you stand a little closer? Yes, you could. Yes, you could. How's the alpha male business, huh? How's the alpha male business? Huh? Kind of busy? Kind of busy, you're kind of weary. Do you get weary being alpha male? I'll bet you do, because you probably have a lot to do. You have a lot to do, don't you? Yes. To look at everything, you have to pee on stuff. Oh, you must get very weary being the alpha male. Tracker is one of my favorites. He is the dominant male of this small pack. All the members of this group were hand reared. Even though they're captive, they're still wild creatures. And unlike domestic dogs, when called, they will only oh. respond to you on their terms. Yeah. Oh, this God. is Amaruk, an Inuit word for wolf. He aspires to be pack leader, rather like a frustrated politician waiting in the wings. When I interact with them, I often talk to them in this rather high-pitched, silly voice. There is a theory in animal communication that most animals, when trying to be friendly, communicate in a very high-pitched tone, whereas if they are aggressive, they tend to vocalize in a lower tone of voice. Oh, my goodness, what a lot of teeth. Jenny Ryan was studying fine arts at the University of Oregon when she read a book about wolves and fell in love with them. Her particular interest is in the relationships that hold a wolf pack together. Her unique field work, studying three different groups of wolves, is supported by Dalhousie University, Halifax. That mournful howling has raised the hackles on the neck of many a lonely traveler and stopped him dead in his tracks. But howling is not an aggressive sound. It's a way of communicating over long distances. In the wild, a lone wolf may howl to attract a mate or to establish his credentials. A pack howls to maintain territory and to get in the mood for hunting. It's an expression of unity within the pack. A pickup truck brings visitors to the compound. Hi, Jenny. Hi, John. Hi, Jenny. Hi, John. Got another roadkill for you. Good. Professor John Fentress, director of the project, and John Burr, a veterinary dietitian, have brought in a deer for the wolves, recently killed on the highway. Yeah, what I'd like to do is uh, observe the pack feeding behavior, because I think uh, what we'll find is that they are going to consume uh, certain portions of the carcass first. And we also might even find differences in the, uh, the social status of an animal in the pack and then what they may be able to consume first. 
It's feeding time for the biggest pack of 12 animals living in a large wooded reserve. In the wild, a wolf pack would hunt big game over a home range of between 40 and 400 square miles, depending on the availability of prey. Wolves are courageous and efficient hunters, tracking their quarry by scent and moving in against the wind. Jenny brings food to this compound about three times a week. She leaves the deer several yards away from the group and retreats to a discreet distance. Even though food is brought in regularly, the wolves are wary. The less confident pack members retreat into the woods. Iona and Azilla, subdominant females, together with Homer, a young male, are reluctant to approach the deer until the dominant male, Fingal, has investigated the offering. He circles cautiously before approaching the carcass. The rest of the pack hang back, watching. This wariness is part of their technique for survival in the wild. Many of the animals they hunt are well equipped with defenses of their own, with antlers and powerful hooves. The mortality rate of hunting wolves is surprisingly high. There is no strict pecking order as to who eats first. This time it's Fingal, the dominant male of this group who takes the initiative. The others soon follow. Their high-pitched squeaking contributes to the friendly atmosphere just before eating. Galen is the heir apparent, but it may be some years before he challenges for the leadership. The alpha male may stay acknowledged leader of the pack for many years. When Fingal, now 11 years old, finally made his successful challenge, it was a bloodless coup. Not so with the females. Two of this group have been killed in fights for dominance. In the wild, when times are hard, hungry wolves will consume up to 20 pounds of meat at once. But here, there's no urgency. Wolves operate one of the most highly developed social organizations in the animal kingdom. During a hunt, the pack's cooperation is total. Once the kill is made, however, animals that were allies in the chase become competitors for the food. In this group, where there's no fear of starvation, it's more of a friendly free-for-all, and there's rarely a fight. Sometimes, as the younger members of the pack try to move in, there's a bit of squabbling. Most of the aggression is shown to members of the same sex. And though it looks dramatic, it's mainly ritualistic. In the end, each will have its share. In wolf society, each animal has a place. In a hillside den deep in the woods, Fingal's mate, Pawnee, the alpha female of the large group, has given birth to cubs. The young are born in late spring when food is abundant.
Jill, a student attached to the research project, takes a nervous walk through the woods. She is watched by curious eyes as she approaches the den site, where Jenny has set up a hidden camera to record the first weeks of the cubs' lives. The students take turns changing the videotapes, day and night, for six weeks. The wolves are watchful, protective of Pawnee and her cubs. Later, Jenny will assess the tapes in her office. When we change each tape in the den, we bring it back to the monitors um, to give it just a quick look through. We're looking to make sure that mother and pups are faring well and make notes on any interesting occurrences that happen. When the pups are first born, they're a very dark color, almost black. And as they get older, they start to turn a lighter brown so that by the time they come out of the den, they're a fairly light brown and eventually start to get the gray color of the adults. At this vulnerable age, the cubs are unable to see or hear, so they're totally dependent on their mother. They can't regulate their body temperature very well, so they need to huddle close for at least the first few days. Unlike many other mammals, the mother is fed and supported by the pack even before her cubs are born. This helps to ensure the survival of the next generation. In a sense, the pack is investing in its own future. Wolves appear to operate a system of planned parenthood. The alpha female frequently prevents other females from breeding, or if they do become pregnant, she can stress them into aborting. Wolves are not truly monogamous, but the dominant male closely guards his mate for the few days she is in season to prevent other males from mating with her. In this way, the alpha male makes sure only his genes go through to the next generation. It's 26 degrees Celsius, a breeze, the ground is dry. There are eight wolves present, seven on the mound. Every other day, Jenny records the activities of each pack. As the summer day wears on and the temperature rises, the wolves retreat to the shade. Creatures of habit, they retire to their favorite cool spot on the mound. A highly developed sense of smell plays an important part in their lives. Using their noses, they read the signs of nature left by passers-by, ensuring the safety and security of their territory. This sense of smell is also used to reinforce the bond between pack members. These playful young males, Murdoch, Dougal, and Rory, are kept separate from the other two packs to avoid overcrowding. Their sparring is interrupted by the arrival of Jenny and John Burr. John has come to take samples of fur for analysis to see if the wolves' diet is keeping them healthy. We'll just sit here for a while and let them settle down. Okay. He moves slowly and gingerly waiting for the wolves to come to him. Although this group of males are hand-reared and are used to human company, they are still wild animals and often hesitant to approach. Don't be afraid. Rory, the friendliest of the three, approaches cautiously. What are you doing? What are you doing? The others hesitate. It's not so bad, is it? That's not so bad, is it? Huh. You were doing the same thing, huh? You were doing the same thing, huh? Rory allows John to take fur from his ruff. What? That feel good? Mm -hmm. The others are curious, and top dog Murdoch comes to see what's happening. 
John takes advantage while he can and gently takes more fur from both of them. He knows they will soon become bored with human company and go back to wolfish business. Okay, let's get started. Before he leaves, John has one other job to do. He has to pick up a sample of droppings. Mark difference between this sample and the last one. Once collected, the sample is sealed and dated for analysis. In the shelter of the den, Pawnee continues to nurse her cubs, which will soon be ready to emerge into the exciting world outside. For the past few weeks, she and one of her female helpers have been bringing back solid food, trying to keep up with ever-growing appetites. Now six weeks old, the cubs' eyes and ears are sharp, and they're getting too big to be cooped up underground. When they finally emerge into the daylight, the cubs won't be on their own. They'll be protected and cared for by all the adult members of the pack. In this society, the males take a major role in bringing up the young. At the moment, Jenny is studying the importance of play. When the cubs are young, their rolling and tumbling together sharpens their reactions and teaches them to respond to each other's signals, essential for cooperative hunting. Their play is silent, for in the wild, any sound might alert a predator. The wolves are very special to me. The more I learn about them, the more I admire them. It's really heartening to realize how much like us they are in so many ways. For example, they live in extended family groups, much as early man did, and care for their young communally. It isn't just the parents that provide for the pups, but everyone else in the pack as well, aunts and uncles, older siblings. The pack also provides for yearlings and pregnant and nursing females. It's a time to learn the skills of adulthood. All the pack members are indulgent with the youngsters and will play with them for hours, inventing new games to keep them occupied, while others will bring food, which they'll regurgitate for them. Wolves play all their lives, and Jenny finds the game rules change as they get older. After a few months, they become more boisterous, and as they grow into young adults, play becomes rougher. Jenny has found that wolves will play even in old age. Another cub looks for an adult playmate, but the adults aren't always in the mood. For the moment, he's ignored. Eventually, the cubs focus their attention on Ursula, the oldest female in the pack. Ever tolerant, she's become something of a granny and a nursemaid. In our captive conditions, the wolves are well provided for, so the behavior we see is basically boom times. In the wild, this is frequently not the case. Only 25% of cubs make it through their first year. The adults and yearlings are simply not able to obtain enough food to feed them all, or they lose their cubs to disease or accident. Once they get through that vital first year, wolves live an average of seven years. But if food is plentiful and the circumstances are favorable, they can live as long as 16. Today, Jenny is bringing the wolves a food John Burr has recommended to balance their intake of deer meat to ensure they're not missing any essential elements. Their digestive systems are identical to those of dogs. 
Not surprising since all dogs from the Chihuahua to the Great Dane can trace their ancestry back to the wolf, first domesticated by Stone Age man 10,000 years ago. As the young ones are persuaded to try the new food, Jenny retreats to her truck to watch their reactions. Even though these wolves know her, they will not approach until she is out of the compound. John's special food will improve their present diet and replace the more varied food they would find in the wild. The study that has brought these timber wolves to this forest of eastern Canada has enriched Jenny's life and done a great deal to restore the reputation of the much maligned family of wolves. Because of her work, we know much more about the family life and social structure of the wolf pack. But even though she respects and admires these animals, Jenny cautions us. In destroying one myth, it is important that we do not create another. It is always a mistake to turn a wolf into a pet. Although I know and love these animals, I respect and understand their right to remain wolves. When keeping watch, I sometimes think that however much I've invested in time and study, the wolves have repaid me immeasurably in gifts of themselves. Mm -hmm. 